Um, welcome everyone to the second part of today's lecture. Um, we just spoke about the main instrument a financial supervisor has at its disposal. Uh, it's usually capital requirements, um, meaning that you set a minimum requirement on the capital a bank or a financial institution more generally has to keep on its balance sheet. And uh, what does it mean? Uh, first of all, in the case of an emergency, in case you are closing in on bankruptcy, um, well, actually, you are hopefully not closing in on bankruptcy. Um, you are ideally pretty far away from bankruptcy because you have too much capital on your balance sheet. That's the first thing. The second thing is that you can also manage and you can also steer the type of business the bank engages in. Why? For example, if there are some business operations that come at a very low price, capital-wise, and some business operations that are heavily punished with higher capital requirements, you can steer banks to some extent away from risky business and uh, steer them into less risky uh, operations. So this is also a side effect of uh, capital requirements. Liquidity is something different. You know, capital um, and leverage is long-term, liquidity is short-term, and usually financial supervisors will also have a close look at the liquidity and liquidity risk of banks. And if they have too little liquidity, um, regulators and supervisors will step in. Um, banks are authorized by BaFin and they get their license from BaFin. And this is what happens in many countries that the financial supervisor allows or disallows certain companies to engage in transactions in the financial sector. So we would hope that financial supervisors prevent some fraudulent companies uh, to enter the financial sector. And we would hope that they allow normal banks to operate um, in the financial sector. Uh, they monitor bank risk and individual individual transactions, just like they do it with the Groß in Million Krisen immer uh, statistic, and they can give out warnings and fines and prohibit certain business. This is interesting nowadays. Uh, it used to be that BaFin was only allowed to um, regulate access to financial sectors by telling a company, yes, you can engage in the financial sector, Yes, no, you don't. Um, BaFin, as a reaction also to the financial crisis, was given uh, uh, additional power to ban certain products. So it's no longer that they regulate market access, but they also regulate which kind of financial products are allowed and which aren't. And they did it the very first time, I think last year, um, with a CFD contract uh, with unlimited loss potential. Um, have I told you this? Contracts for differences, CFDs? Fancy thing. If you ever watch YouTube and have a history of watching finance videos like I have, uh, you will see a lot of uh, ads uh, on, financial, on the financial sector as a whole, but also on CFDs. What this is, is this is more or less, more or less a derivative contract that is tailored to retail customers and you can bet on certain indices, you can bet on some indexes um, with leverage. And uh, this is why they're called contracts for differences. You, for example, buy the S&P 500, and every dollar the S&P 500 increases in value, you can, for example, use leverage, use a lever of 10, and then you will earn $10 for each dollar the S&P 500 increases. Problem is, just this works like a regular option contract. Problem is, first of all, it's uh, targeted at retail customers. They all come out of London and some other tax haven states. Um, and the second problem is that some CFDs have unlimited loss potential. And you need, uh, you can actually lose your house if you invest in these things. And this happened a couple of times and BaFin has stepped in and prohibited uh, the sale of these financial products in Germany as a reaction to this rather extreme, um, some extreme cases of CFD trading. Okay, now let's next turn to the US banking system. 
because I think you should know a little bit about the world's largest and most important banking se sector. Um, we'll later on see this maybe at the end of the lecture in a little bit more detail, but here we'll specifically focus on banking supervision and regulation. Now, um, again, banking sectors will differ from country to country and this is a good thing because we have competition from country to country between countries and for researchers like me this is very interesting because we can assess differences in the different uh, national banking sectors in the way they supervise and regulate and we can use these differences to check which uh, system works best for example if we compare the european banking sector to the american sector and we see some uh, big differences in the profitability and the stability of the sectors, uh, we can try to match these uh, differences to differences in regulation and relate them to differences in regulation and supervision. This is what is done all the time. And you can find the best type of data on this from the World Bank and the IMF, especially the World Bank. The World Bank has huge data sets on uh, national banking systems and uh, supervisory systems and there you can get some data that also is frequently used in bachelor and master thesis. Now we are shortly discussing the US American banking system and please apologize if I say American we Europeans are used to that to, to equalize America with the United States I know that especially people from middle and uh, South America uh, sometimes I have a neighbor who's from Colombia and he takes offense uh, when I talk of America. He, he's American, although he's from Colombia, not the United States. So please apologize, apologies for that. Um, so let's start with the US, American banking. I remember, aren't you from Canada? Yeah, so you're immediately affected by this, sorry. Um, so let's talk about the US banking sector uh, and after that we'll discuss the Bank for International Settlements and some other supranational banks. Uh, again, for research this is very interesting because we can see differences in supervisory uh, systems and we can try to figure out which system works best and some results are quite interesting. Um, the US banking system. It's, nowadays it's very different, uh, difficult to state whether it's uh, a separate banking system or a universal banking system. I told you this, I think, in one of the first lectures. As a result of the Great Depression in the 30s, 1930s, um, the US enacted, uh, Congress enacted the Glass-Steagall Act. Uh, the Glass-Steagall Act more or less installed a separate banking system where commercial banks were not allowed to do investment banking and vice versa. They did pretty well, almost 60 years with that. Under the Clinton administration, we saw the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, the GLBA of 1999, and uh, it, it changed a lot. It changed the separate banking system and it now allowed uh, universal banks to be created and most of the time commercial banks to buy investment banks. After that, size of average size of banks increased dramatically because banks merged and merged and merged and merged and nowadays it's uh, quite difficult to, to, to clearly identify the system as a strictly separate banking system or a universal banking system because after the financial crisis we saw the Dodd-Frank Act, Dodd-Frank again reinstalled certain parts of the Graham Leach, uh, no, of the Glass-Steagall Act. Uh, in our German main textbook here, Hartmann, Wendels, Pfingsten, Weber, they still speak of a separate banking system in 2006. That was definitely wrong at that time. Um, and nowadays we see that Trump would very much like to repeal certain parts of the Dodd-Frank Act because uh, the Dodd-Frank Act more or less um, made, included and made supervision tougher and made it tougher on banks. So what types of banks do we have Do we have in the US? Commercial banks, thrift institutions, investment banks, brokers, dealers, and other banks, non-banks or near banks. We can leave out the non-banks for a moment. In essence, non-banks or near banks are financial institutions that offer some type of banking service 
but which aren't registered as banks and which are not supervised as banks. And sometimes we call them, them shadow banks because they are living in the shadow you know, where no supervisor can see them. But apart from that, we have commercial banks, pretty clear, thrift institutions, and with thrift institutions, we have mutual savings banks, credit in unions, and savings and loan associations. Um, let me ask you, because I have no idea what the Canadian banking sector looks like. Uh, is it similar in Canada? Do you also have thrift institutions? Hmm. Can you explain what thrift means? Because I don't think the German students know this. So this is rather irregular and unusual vocabulary. What are thrift shops? Yeah? Savings and loan associations and credit unions or mutual savings banks, uh, they are what we would, I guess, most, the, the closest thing we would have in Germany are credit unions, Volksbanken. Thrift institutions, for example, the thrift shops are usually non-profit shops. They, they buy and sell uh, second-hand goods. And the idea of a thrift shop is that you can bring something there then it's sold and it's, it's a non-profit organization. And credit unions uh, are actually our Volksbanken, our credit unions, our mutual banks. Mutual meaning that it's a registered uh, mutual society, eingetragene Genossenschaft. And this means customers are shareholders and each shareholder has the same share in the corporation, in the company. It's most... It's as socialist as it gets in a free market uh, economy. It's relativ, relativ sozialistisch, kommunistisches uh, Überbleibsel. Eine Genossenschaft, jeder ist Genosse, jeder hat den gleichen Anteil. Und sie können nicht mehr Aktien oder mehr Anteile uh, an einer Genossenschaft erwerben. And these are credit unions, mutual savings banks and savings and loan association. We don't have to go into more detail. The one main distinction between, for example, mutual savings banks and credit unions is in the US, um, the one, it's historic reasons. Uh, the ones on the East Coast, uh, I think, are the mutual savings banks and as uh, West, uh, Western settlers uh, went west, at some points um, they were called credit unions. So commercial banks, those are the classic ones. Those are the private uh, corporations classical commercial banks, Bank of America, Citigroup, um, and over the 80s, interaction of bad lending, missing diversification, and a poor economic situation led to the insolvency of numerous commercial banks. Also very different to Germany. The US frequently sees bank defaults. In Germany, no one ever hears of a bank going bankrupt anymore because we have a limited number of banks. We only have like 400 banks. And they don't go bankrupt nowadays because we also have a lot of credit unions and public banks, uh, state-owned banks. But in the U.S., it's, it's, it's more of a free economy. Banks go bankrupt all the time. And especially during the 80s, during the crises. Um, and after that, we saw a huge consolidation wave. Banks merged and merged and merged and merged. This is why nowadays Bank of America and Citigroup are such huge uh, institutions. Thrift institutions. We would translate it, I guess, in Spar und Darlehenskassen. Second biggest group. Mutual savings bank, mainly in New England, savings and loan associations, as well as credit unions. So similar to our German savings banks and cooperative banks, they are usually in the possession of the depositors or clients and they were founded in order uh, for customers to get credit and have an opportunity to have a checkings account. So they, usually they are interested, of course, in profits, but they not primarily. You know? So they are similar to our German Volksbanken, but a little bit different. And just like our banks, they operate on a smaller scale and at a local level. Also, um, 
you probably know this. Um, I don't think the German students know this. American banks, US banks, can be ridiculously small. Some banks, especially if you go to the Western states like Nevada, New Mexico, some banks, they operate out of one branch and they might have five employees and they only operate like, it, it, it looks like a gas station with, with an ATM. If we think of a bank, we usually think of at least a Sparkasse, of at least a bank that operates like 10, 15 branches and is part of a huge network. In the US, a bank can be extremely small. They can be extremely large with Bank of America, but they also can be extremely small. And then it is quite clear that these banks obviously also uh, can easily go bankrupt. Um, you need to know about the SNL crisis. The savings and loan crisis in the 80s and 90s, uh, it was back then before the financial crisis. The SNL crisis was one of the largest financial crisis we have had in the world. During the 80s and 60s, um, approximately 1,000 of the 3,000 savings and loan associations in the US went bankrupt. What happened? There was a deregulation by the Depository Institutions Deregulation Monetary Control Act and the Tax Reform Act of 86, Ronald Reagan. Um, and it more or less resulted um, in a chain of events in a deterioration of house prices and mortgage loans. And then when um, we saw a rise in uh, base rates to fight inflation, interest rates increased and a lack of diversification because especially the small savings and loan associations had only given out loans to mortgage, uh, mortgage loans to house owners in their local vicinity. Uh, most of them uh, went bankrupt. It's it's um, funny to see the parallels here to the financial crisis. Yeah? No diversification, changes to regulation, low interest rate level at first, then sudden increase in interest rates, and bank had given out too uh, many bad loans, and then they had problems. The only thing nice about the SNL crisis was it was just not a big bang, but it went uh, over almost 10 years. But that's the SNL crisis. No one, no one talks about the SNL crisis these days uh, anymore because um, it, it looks tiny in comparison to the financial crisis, but back then it was a huge uh, disaster. And you can see approximately $160 billion of damage to the public sector. And as a result, um, we saw the, in the installation of the Office of Thrift Supervision, the OTS, the Savings Association Insurance Fund uh, for Deposit Insurance and the Resolution Trust Corporation for Resolution. Resolution means that if a bank is bankrupt, you need to resolve it in an orderly fashion. You don't want it to uh, implode on its own, but you want to resolve it um, in an orderly fashion. You also have investment banks, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, previously the Lehman Brothers and others. Um, and these are investment banks that, as the name would suggest, they only offer investment banking services. Now, most of uh, investment banks uh, that previously, under the separate banking system, only operated as um, investment banks were subsequently bought up by large commercial banks. And actually, most of the investment banks also are also registered as commercial deposit-taking banks. Do you have an idea why? During the financial crisis, uh, the, main, the main mechanism to save banks and to stabilize the financial system was TARP, T-A-R-P, the Troubled Assets Relief Program. I think relief, yes. And what TARP was, is the US state and the Fed bought assets and supplied banks with equity. They recapitalized banks to stabilize the financial system, a huge bailout program. And anyone know why investment banks also uh, suddenly all wanted uh, licenses as commercial banks and registered as commercial banks? Because investment banks were not eligible for TARP but commercial banks were. 
So for investment banks to get a cheap bail government bailout, they needed to be registered as a commercial bank. Then you also have securities brokers, securities dealers, former trading securities without, where else to let it trade with own holdings, and usually brokers and uh, dealers will live from commissions and uh, the bid are spread on what they um, trade. And we also have non-banks and near-banks. Those include pension funds, mutual funds, and money market funds. So non-bank entities that nevertheless offer banking-like services and have banking-like characteristics. For example, um, factoring and leasing companies are also near banks. On a side note, this has become infamous during the financial crisis as shadow banking. Shadow banking means that you have a financial institution that is not supervised and regulated um, and is not allowed to legally conduct banking business, but offers near banking services, like for example, providing firms with liquidity and with financing. Then you are giving out loans, in, in, in fact, you're giving out loans to customers and to, um, to uh, uh, client firms, but you're not supervised. And during the financial crisis, this was a huge problem because suddenly regulators and supervisors realized that there was a huge part of the financial sector they had no clue about. Uh, money market funds were a huge problem. Shadow banks, usually hedge funds, money market funds, EDFs, and in general, they do not finance uh, themselves through deposits. They are thus not subject to re usual regulation, and sometimes they're subsidiaries of banks in offshore tax haven states. Problem is, that if they are not supervised, well, what does the regulatory arbitrage mean? What is arbitrage? Who can tell me what arbitrage is? Arbitrage, yeah? to exploit differences in prices for the same good in order to get a risk-free profit, to get a, to get a free lunch. Um, das Ausnutzen von Preisdifferenzen für ein und dasselbe Gut, um einen risikolosen Gewinn realisieren zu können. If, for example, you see the stock of Facebook trading at $50 here and trading at $60 across the street, having taken into account the bid-ask spread, the liquidity concerns, why not buy it for 50 and sell it immediately to 60, at 60 across the street? Two prices for the same good, for the same product, meaning that you can exploit the difference in the prices for risk-free profit. That's an arbitrage. And if a market is arbitrage-free, there's no potential for exploiting such an arbitrage. And arbitrage, if an arbitrage, or arbitrage freedom is call, also called what? The law of one price. One good, only one price. What then is regulatory arbitrage? What does the regulatory arbitrage mean? Exploiting differences in regulation to do the same, to get a risk-free profit. And this is what uh, is done here. Why are you exploiting regulatory arbitrage if you are a shadow bank? Very simple. If you are supervised, you will face capital requirements. If you face higher capital requirements, it's more costly to do business. You have higher cost, capital costs. And if you are not supervised, but do the same type of business, you have an advantage over banks which are supervised because you have lower capital costs. Now, if you're interested in this, I can only advise you to read uh, the paper Shadow Insurance in Econometrica by Ralph Koyen and Motohiro Yogo. Koyen is at the University of Chicago, Yogo is at Princeton. Um, shadow insurance. 
Now, everyone knows about shadow banking, a money market fund that offers financing but is not supervised as a bank. Any idea, probably not, what shadow insurance could mean? And they, they, they identified this in, in their paper and uh, notified regulators of this. Very a problem that is US specific. In the US, um, you have uh, what is called an affiliated reinsurer. What is an affiliated reinsurer? The German translation is Eigenrückversicherer. What does that mean? An affiliated reinsurer. Can you give me a German example of an Eigenrückversicherer? Or an affiliated reinsurer? Which is the largest global reinsurance company? It's a Munich Re, Münchener Rück. And which company does Munich Re own? It owns Ergo, primary insurer. So if you're a holding and you have an insurance company, but you also have a reinsurance company, and the reinsurance company sells reinsurance to the insurance business inside your own holding, inside your own conglomerate company. That's what is called an affiliated reinsurer. Ein eigener Rückversicherer ist einfach nur ein Rückversicherungsunternehmen in ihrem eigenen Konzern. Und wenn die Münchner Rück Rückversicherung an die Ergo verkauft, naja, dann beißt sich die Katze in den Schwanz. Ne? Also sie wollen ja gerade Rück... Englisch again. You want to do reinsurance and want to buy reinsurance because you need to limit your own risk. So usually you have rules in place Oh, now, maybe you can tell me, what is now the problem of reinsurance and of an affiliated reinsurer? What Koyan and Yoro found out, or they claim this to be a problem, is that many American life insurance companies have affiliated reinsurance companies, usually on the Bermuda Islands, offshore, where they're not regulated. And they are... They are transferring liabilities from their insurance business by buying reinsurance from their re affiliated reinsurer on the Bermuda Islands. The result is, if you buy reinsurance, you're limiting your risk, right? You're, you're hedging. And if you're hedging, you can expect that your capital requirements will be lower in your insurance business. Okay. Problem is, if you're buying reinsurance from yourself, from your affiliated reinsurer, you would expect that the supervisor is not dumb enough or is, is not as dumb as to, to, to smell this and to say, well, okay, let's decrease capital requirements here in your insurance business, then your re affiliated reinsurer has higher capital requirements. Problem is, the, re the affiliated reinsurers are usually located offshore on the Bermuda Islands. And what US life insurers allegedly have done is they have shifted liabilities from their, um, from their balance sheet to their re affiliated reinsurers, lowering, effectively lowering their capital requirements and using this advantage to lower premiums. And um, Koyan and Yogo actually calculate uh, the amount, the percentage of how much the insurance premiums are lower as a result of this type of regulatory arbitrage. And <coughs> now it gets interesting. And do you know how these affiliated reinsurers get their financing? From letters of credit from banks, US banks. And if now one of these affiliated reinsurers would implode and life insurance companies would have problems, well, banks would, in, would be in as well. Um, this is very interesting. Um, this is something very specific to the US. Um, this was a huge news a couple of years ago because uh, th there's only this one paper that suddenly uh, identified this as a problem, as a potential problem. There's one paper by Scott Harrington from the, uh, from the University of Pennsylvania uh, the Wharton School, very famous uh, Ivy League, I think it's, yeah, it's Ivy League um, University. And uh, Scott Harrington, who is a professor of economics, argued that, oh, come on, 
we've known about this all the time, and this is not a, this is not bad. This is just okay. Footnote: This research has been financed by the American Association of Life Insurers. In German, we have a saying: "Ein Schelm, der dabei böses denkt." You're nasty if you're thinking something bad, if you're smelling something bad here. Uh, it has been a huge controvers uh, controversy since then. Uh, shadow insurance could be a problem, and the problem is, again, that if life insurers have a problem, they don't really have reinsurance because it's in their own conglomerate. And the second problem is that banks could be affected as well because they've given out cre letters of credit to those affiliated reinsurers. I'll say this in German again. By, by im Shadow Insurance das Problem, uh, so argumentieren zum Beispiel uh, Koyen und Yogo, uh, diese um, Eigenrückversicherer uh, haben, so ähnlich wie das auch bei der Finanzmarktkrise halt so schön passiert ist, uh, die finanzieren sich vor allem über Bürgschaften von Banken. Man könnte ja argumentieren, wenn der Lebensversicherer uh, hops geht, na gut, dann hat er keine Rückversicherung, dann ist der Rückversicherer auch hops und geht pleite. Uh, dann könnte man immer noch sagen, ja, wen interessiert es? Dann ist halt ein Lebensversicherer weg. Ja? Problem ist aber, dass deren Argument dass die Finanzierung dieser eigenen Rückversicherer vor allem über Bankbürgschaften läuft und damit plötzlich auch ein Risiko, das originär aus der Versicherungswirtschaft kommt, plötzlich wie eine Schrotflinte auf die Bankenlandschaft zielen könnte. Also, äh, war, war sehr, sehr spannend, äh, der Artikel. Ist in, ist in Econometrica. So that's Shadow Banking, Shadow Insurance. Yeah? One thing you should know is, Uh, and you will hear this all the time when we talk about the financial crisis. During the financial crisis, things went a little bit differently than during the previous crises. Usually in a banking crisis, you see a bank run. Depositors running to their banks and demanding repayment of their deposit. That didn't, apart from Northern Rock, but this was a singular event. That didn't happen during the financial crisis. What happened was, Banks went to the interbank market and didn't give credit and didn't give out new loans to other banks. The interbank sector dried up completely and liquidity in wholesale funding dried up. And what is done on the interbank market is what we call repo transaction, repurchase agreements, repos. What these are, these are agreements between institutional investors to pledge collateral, to pledge securities, and to get financing uh, with these uh, securities pledged as collateral. And then you get financing, wholesale liquidity, wholesale funding from other banks. And uh, you agree to repurchase the securities. You buy, it's more or less, more or less a, a sell and buyback transaction. Haben wir auch im Deutschen uh, Wertpapier Veräußerungsgeschäfte um, also heißt ein bisschen anders. Report uh, ist letztlich Wertpapierleihe, Wertpapierleihgeschäfte. Sie, sie verkaufen ein Wertpapier, kriegen dafür Finanzierung, kriegen dafür Kapital, sie verpflichten sich aber gleichzeitig, die wieder zurückzukaufen. Also ist eine andere Art und Weise wie ein Kredit und das ist die Art und Weise, wie Banken sich gegenseitig über Report-Transaktionen gegenseitig Liquidität zur Verfügung stellen. You will often hear the phrase the run on repos during the financial crisis. Banks ran, not depositors. Banks ran on the interbank market and they tried to get wholesale funding via repo uh, transactions and suddenly no one was willing to enter those repo transactions and wholesale funding dried up. Problem, at that time, very intransparent, regulators didn't have this on their radar and there was a problem. We have in the US, what we call a du the dual banking system. Dual banking system, it means that usually a bank is always supervised at two levels, the state and the federal level. And we distinguish and differentiate between state chartered and federally chartered banks. What does it mean? What is a charter? A license to operate. No, no. Chartered heißt einfach nur, dass sie zum Geschäft zugelassen sind. If you ever see uh, a word like national bank or federal, first federal bank, blah, 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 it means that you are 
nationally chartered, federally chartered. Um, state banks, on the other hand, are authorized and supervised by a state, and the federal banks are supervised and authorized by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the OCC. Probably an organization you've never heard of before. The OCC supervises national banks, and we are not talking about a central bank. This is not the Fed. These are national banks that are federally chartered. Hmm? Say this again in German. Kennen die meisten wahrscheinlich nicht. In den USA können sich auf zwei Arten zulassen. Entweder durch einen Bundesstaat, dann sind sie eine State Bank, oder aber sie werden bundesstaatlich zugelassen. Dann sind sie eine National Bank oder eine Federal Bank. Das kennen wir bei uns gar nicht in Deutschland. Bei uns werden sie von der BaFin zugelassen, dann ist egal, ob sie in Sachsen oder Thüringen ihre Geschäfte machen. In den USA ist das ein Unterschied. Also ob sie vom State, ob sie State Chartered oder Federally Chartered sind. State Banks that are members of the Federal Reserve System are additionally supervised by the Fed. State banks that are not members of the Federal Reserve are supervised by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So this is the dual banking system, meaning that the federal banks, federally chartered banks, they are supervised at the federal level no matter what. But the state chartered banks can choose they can become a member of the Federal Reserve System or if they are not a member of the Federal Reserve System, they are supervised by the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And this is why we call it a dual banking system because banks are controlled by state and by the federal authority. Now, again, this is also weird for us Germans. The federal, there is not no such thing as the U.S. Central Bank. In fact, uh, you can see that with the, the U.S. as in any aspects of uh, U.S. policy and politics, it has been a long struggle. Um, I think um, after or during uh, the Revolutionary War, I think Alexander Hamilton uh, introduced and created the first national bank and the first central bank of the United States. Problem is, during the Revolutionary War, uh, the United States needed capital, they needed money to finance the Revolutionary War. That's the only reason why they installed a central bank. They didn't want that. The states didn't want that. And again, as with anything in the United States, the electoral college, slavery, uh, anything, it's always a struggle to delegate power to the federal level because usually the states want to keep the power. And then they had a central bank and nowadays we have the federal reserve system. Also, on a side note, they used to have the dollar from the very start, but um, the green dollars, the dollar notes we know nowadays came in, into existence only only in the, I think, at the late uh, 19th century, because they realized that at that time, each bank and each member of the Federal Reserve System was allowed to print its own dollar notes. And counterfeit notes circulated a lot. And uh, the Civil War didn't help, because in the Civil War, the southern states tried to destabilize the northern states by increasing and, uh, and uh, printing a lot of counterfeit dollar notes, because they had their own dollar notes. So even, even the question of a single currency with, with standardized dollar notes, bank notes, was a huge problem and a huge discussion in the US. And nowadays, we have a central banking system that is the Federal Reserve System. Now, if we speak of the Fed, usually we refer to the Federal Reserve Board, the FRB, not the Federal Reserve System. The system consists of the 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks, the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, D.C., and the member banks. The national banks have to be members, and as we have seen, the state banks can choose to be a member of the, FD, uh, of the Federal Reserve, or otherwise they will be supervised by the FDIC. And approximately one-third of all commercial banks um, are members. This is weird for us because in our, in our understanding from German 
uh, from, from the German banking system. The central bank, Deutsche Bundesbank, is a state institution at the federal level and it's completely independent uh, of any type of private bank. But the Federal Reserve System is a system of 12 federal banks, the Federal Reserve Board, and actually uh, quite a lot of private banks, commercial banks, that also uh, form part of the Federal Reserve System. This is the Federal Reserve System. And as you can see, if you are a little bit more uh, versed in uh, US politics, this is uh, the usual um, division of the United States into the federal circuits. Uh, you might know that, for example, um, I think these are uh, similar and equal to the federal circuits. Uh, for example, in the US, you also have federal courts, not just the Supreme Court, but you had federal courts, and those federal courts um, are uh, distributed according to the federal circuit. And you sometimes hear decisions of U.S. courts. That's the U.S. court for the first circuit, the U.S. court for the second circuit. And these are the circuits, one, two, three, four, five. For example, uh, the U.S. courts for the 12th circuit, circuits are those responsible and in charge of those Western states. And here you see the Federal Reserve Districts. Um, the uh, rectangles uh, show you the location of the Federal Reserve Banks. Let's go through them. The Federal Reserve Bank for the First Circuit is Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It's uh, the largest, by far the largest and most important one because it has to supervise Wall Street. Federal Reserve Bank of, oh no, sorry, first one is Boston. Second one is New York. Third one is Third one, any idea? Third one is Philadelphia, correct. Fifth is Richmond, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, sixth is Atlanta. Seven is Chicago, should be Chicago. Eight is St. Louis. Uh, eight is St. Louis. Nine is Minneapolis. Ten is Kansas City, don't ask me if it's Kansas City, Kansas or Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, also weird, they have two Kansas cities. It's one city, but the state border crosses, divides the two cities. So you have Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri. And I think Kansas City, Missouri is larger. Um, 11, it's, uh, I think, Dallas. Um, and San Francisco on the West Coast. Those are the 12 um, Federal Reserve Banks. The OCC is the Office of the Controller of the Currency, Supervisory and Regulatory Authority for all national banks and thrift institutions. And the FDIC is the National Deposit Insurance Authority. And uh, the credit unions are insured by the National Credit Union Administration, the NCUA. It's complicated. I told you it's it's not as simple as in Germany, but you have a lot of um, institutions. And last but not least, investment banks, stock exchanges, stock trading, brokers and dealers, only SEC. The Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC is in charge of anything, everything that is related to stock exchanges and stock trading. Also very interesting. They struggled a lot to install the Securities and Exchange Commission. And do you know why? Because people were defrauded all the time. You could buy stocks from companies that never existed. And there are some very famous examples of types of stocks that were sold to investors for, for companies that had never existed a day. And when you, when the, when the, um, especially the federal government saw such widespread investor fraud. At some point, even the states agreed to install a security, the Securities and Exchange Commission at the federal level to supervise stock exchanges and stock trading. Uh, I think nowadays, even under Trump, it's unthinkable uh, that the states would give up some power 
uh, in order uh, to, to supervise uh, financial institutions. So that's the US system. OCC, the OTS actually has been closed down as a result of the financial crisis. OCC, FDIC, Federal Reserve System, and um, FDIC, FC, NCUA, and so on. So it's, it's complicated. Supranational banks. Uh, we do have even larger banks, and what we usually consider to be um, supranational banks are the World Bank Group, the IMF, in fact, technically not even a bank, the Bank for International Settlements, and at the European level, the European Investment Bank, and maybe even the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. That's also one. Um, Let's go through them. Uh, let's start with the World Bank. Actually, it's not a bank. It's these are five banks, uh, five financial institutions: the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the International Development Association, the International Finance Corporation, the Multilateral Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, and the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. It is usually only referred to as the World Bank, and we usually mean the first one. Technically, those are five independent organizations, but they are in the same house, and um, it's, it's virtually one organization. But those are five institutions that are slightly different, and the goal is development aid in less developed member states of the United Nations. So the World Bank Group does not provide transfer payments it provides credit and loans. And its aim is development, economic development aid. Remember this because people sometimes mix up the IMF and the World Bank. The World Bank is in for helping underdeveloped countries. They are the ones giving out cheap loans to countries like in, in Southeast Asia or Southern America or Africa, and it's development aid. Um, you can see, look through all those five member um, organizations. It's not so in interesting. Usually we refer to the first one as the World Bank. Members, those are the nations and countries in the United Nations. They hold shares of capital in relation to their economic strength. It can raise capital itself and grant development aid loans. And the rest of the four institutions more or less do the same. They resolve disputes, they give out loans, Financing differs a little bit, but that's the World Bank. What is the IMF? The International Monetary Fund, in German, Internationaler Währungsfonds, uh, is again an organization of the United Nations, in fact. And its task is not development aid, but it's promoting international cooperation in monetary policy, extension of world trade, that's a good topic right now, and stabilization of exchange rates. And for this purpose, the IMF can act as a lender of last resort to countries. And the IMF is famous or infamous for doing so a couple of times, for example, in, uh, in Greece, uh, in cooperation with the Euro system and the European Union and uh, European Commission. And in some South American states. They acted as a lender of last resort, and what they usually do is, they act as a lender of last resort, they help a country prevent uh, a government bankruptcy, a state bankruptcy, sovereign bankruptcy, but they will also call for changes in economic policy, changes to and reforms to the country's political system, and this has uh, caused the IMF to have a rather bad reputation, especially in left wing, uh, with left wing politicians. On the positive side, you can argue that the IMF is a huge think tank of experts that are not influenced by, uh, by politicians and by politics, and who can see things clearly and uh, call for necessary reforms. So on the plus side, you could argue, well, they come in to a country, they act as a lender of last resort, 
and they bring in their expertise to help the country uh, do the reforms that are necessary to bring the country back on its feet. If you want to put it a little bit more negatively, you could argue you have unelected technocrats uh, who have uh, no democratic uh, legitimization um, and who come to a country, give out some loans, prevent that company from defaulting on otherwise huge debts and then asking for reforms uh, people will not like. And in the case of, for example, Greece, uh, well, the IMF together with the European Central Bank and the Euro system, more or less, uh, it didn't work. I guess it worked as planned. Greece is back on its feet now, but I don't think it has uh, done anything good with the reputation of the IMF, at least in Greece. Well, because they are famous for calling for reforms. In that case, same argument goes for countries like Argentina, uh, and there are some other examples from South America. The Bank for International Settlements, the Bank of uh, Bank for International Settlements, German Bank für Internationalen Zahlungsausgleich, BEZ, or BIS in English. The BIS is located where? In a, in a famously neutral country, uh, because the Bank for International Settlements, and that's how it got its name, was installed and was founded as a bank to clear the reparation payments of Germany after World War I to France, England, probably Russia. We paid some things. That's the BIS. And where do you where do you found an organization that is meant to be neutral? Switzerland. It's in Basel. Basel or Baal, French. Uh, it's in Basel. Uh, it's meant nowadays to be a central bank of central banks, and it engages in clearing between central banks, and nowadays, most importantly, in bringing expertise and giving a forum to discuss the harmonization of global banking supervision and also insurance supervision, and more generally, the supervision of the financial sector. It hosts two very important uh, sub organizations, which ones? Well, it's on the slide. First of all, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. So, if you ever hear anything like Basel II, Basel III, we'll talk about this later on, uh, it's coming from the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision that is hosted at the Bank for International Settlements. And the BIS is also home of the IAIS the International Association of Insurance Supervisors. Who is a member of IAIS for Germany? BaFin and Bundesbank. So all the national regulators and supervisors, they are members, most of them, I guess North Korea is not, um, most of the world's supervisors, they are, for example, members of the IAIS. How does it work? Very practically. If you start after completing a master's thesis, you start working at BaFin. You start working at Deutsche Bundesbank. If you do a good job, you will get promoted and you will be sent to Basel and you will be, you will be uh, on a loan, more or less, from BaFin or Bundesbank to the Bank for International Settlements or the European Central Bank, works the same there, and you will start working for IIS or the Basel Committee. And these committees and organizations are actually formed by uh, employees and members coming from all the national regulators and supervisors. So one would think, and I think it's also the case, that IMF, World Bank, ECB, IIS, also Basel Committee, Bank for International Settlements, those usually recruit uh, the best people from pools of excellent people. So they do have a reputation of uh, being a think tank. And the voting rights, in the case of the Bank for International Settlements, the voting rights depend on the ownership interest, but it's prohibited from accepting bills of exchange and lending to government, so it's not the IMF. And nowadays, it's mostly about discussing new rules and harmonizing supervision in banking and insurance. We also have the European Investment Bank. The European Investment Bank is exactly what it is. It's a bank to foster investment and to uh, give out loans 
for example, to municipalities, to um, improve the development of a single market uh, in the European Union. And it is located alongside the EU, EU institutions, thus it is independent from the European Commission. Capital owners are the member states and additional financing can also be provided by issuing bonds. And the main focus is the improvement of intra-European economic and social cohesion, the development of trans-European networks and environmental protection. What does that mean? If we start to build a new highway from Germany to Poland and on the other side to France, so it is a trans-European highway, it's a trans-European street, part of the costs can be financed by the European Investment Bank. The European Investment Bank was installed to give additional financing to public infrastructure projects like building roads, uh, canals, uh, data highways and these sort of things to make the European more coherent, to bring down borders when it comes to transportation uh, and uh, these sort of things. So that's the European Investment Bank. So that's central banking for you. Um, every country has its own central bank system, its own system of financial supervision. Uh, it's also very interesting to see how it's done in the UK or in Japan. Maybe if we have time, we'll see this later on. As you can see, special characteristics of foreign banking systems. But you should now have at least seen the complexity uh, supervision has in the US. Any idea how insurance supervision is done in the United States? As complicated as it is with banking, it's pretty simple when it comes to insurance. State level and state level only. Every state has usually has a state commissioner, uh, an insurance commissioner, and insurance companies are regulated at the state level only. However, the US have something like the Basel Committee as well, uh, they have a forum where all those insurance commissioners, those state commissioners, where they meet and they discuss things and they have installed single rules and um, they, have they have agreed upon to install the same rule, some rules in all states. And do you know how this is called? It's the National Association of insurance commissioners, the NAIC. The NAIC is, it is not binding. The insurance commissioners discuss matters of insurance supervision in the US uh, as part of the NAIC. Uh, and uh, in the NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, they will sometimes agree on uniform rules that will be implemented in all states but there is no regulation at the federal level, at least until the financial crisis. Nowadays, there are some few ex ex uh, uh, exceptions, but most of, uh, federal, uh, most of insurance supervision is done at the state level. This also means each state has an insurance commissioner, and sometimes the office of the insurance commissioner will include the, of the insurance commissioner and maybe two or three people. If you're in a Take, for example, Nebraska or even worse, uh, Wyoming. Wyoming has a population that is smaller than the population of Leipzig. It has approximately 500,000 inhabitants. You don't need, need a large insurance supervisory agency for Wyoming. Yeah? In New York, it's different, but in some states, it's rather small. So insurance supervision is done at the state level and you will actually see this from time to time because the NAIC um, collects data on all U.S. insurance companies and you can buy data, for example, balance sheet data from the NAIC and some uh, supervisory reports from the NAIC and usually the NAIC is the best source of data on U.S. insurance companies. Okay. Any questions? concerning banking supervision and the U.S. banking system. 
No questions. Okay. Uh, I guess I have to make a decision now if we want to continue uh, at this late hour or if we want to uh, do this next week. What comes now is business models um, and how banks can earn a profit. Uh, this at some points is very straightforward. Well, banks are still in the traditional lending business. They take in deposits, they finance themselves with issuing bonds and most of the time taking in deposits and they give out loans. However, it's a little bit more tricky when it comes to um, commission fees uh, and investment banking. There you have more additional sources of income um, and I guess it will get more and more important and more and more interesting in the future, especially here in the European Union with interest rates being at 0%. Why? Well, it doesn't work like that anymore. Um, actually, I had to open a savings account personally because I had a deposit from uh, someone who, uh, who rented a flat from me and I have to make a, a safety deposit uh, for um, my uh, my the person who's rented the apartment, and I had to go to a bank and open a savings account, a Sparbuch. I'm I'm I'm. It's not my money, uh, but I'm earning, and she's earning 0.01 percent interest on that savings account. This is not a viable business model anymore. You you will no longer sell savings accounts. Uh, your checkings account will offer 0% and if you are unlucky at some points bank will charge a negative interest rate on on even smaller amounts of money on your checkings account. So banks will have to react at some point to the zero interest uh, policy world we're living in right now and this is when uh, business models will change and you see some banks changing business models, some banks uh, not reacting to this and will be interesting to see which banks will survive. And as you can see, we will talk about the very basic things, deposit taking and lending. You should know a little bit about lending, uh, deposit taking, I guess we could just skip that part for now, at least for the next five to 10 years, because no one will care about deposit taking in banks. Banks can get any type of financing from the European Central Bank. It's no longer a problem for them, but we'll talk about it anyway. It's more interesting when it comes to lending and when it comes to investment banking. So I guess because it's already late, uh, let's stop here. Uh, if you have no further questions, thank you very much for your attention and uh, see you next week. Thank you.